Hey everyone, I'm Nick, and this is Bits of Architecture. So in this episode of the series, we're going to be talking about the Powerwall. So for many years, we saw the rapid increase in the frequency of our processors. So we blasted through the megahertz range and into the low gigahertz range. But for the past, you know, decade or so, we've been really stu been stuck in this low gigahertz range. So, you know, top of the line modern processors today really cap out at, you know, this four to five gigahertz range. But why exactly don't we have, say, 10 gigahertz processors or CPUs today? Now, this 10 gigahertz number largely comes from Intel's own technology roadmap from the very early 2000s. So here I've got this article headline here from, you know, December of 2000, talking about Intel having 10 gigahertz processors by 2005 running at less than a volt. So why exactly did we not get these processors? And the high level reason really comes down to power. So for many years, power and frequency increased together and we eventually just hit a practical limit. So it's difficult to bring in this power into our chips and to distribute it. And it also makes our chips difficult to cool, right? So power gets dissipated as heat and you can't rely on in customers having, you know, these large complex, you know, cooling systems for every single one of your processors, right? Um, you have to think about the practicality um, from the aspect of an end customer. So to really understand about, you know, why this power kept creeping up, we really have to talk about the underlying technology, um, which is going to be the CMOS. So CMOS just stands for uh, Complementary Metal Oxide Semiconductor. Um, this is really the driving technology behind our integrated circuits. And our CMOS has two main uh, points of energy consumption. It's going to be our dynamic energy. So this is the energy to switch states. So you go from zero to one or say one to zero. And then we also have this component called static energy, which is due to things like leakage current. And typically our dynamic energy is the dominant uh, one of these two, right? For our energy consumption. So for many years, we could largely ignore static energy or you know, not consider it you know, nearly as heavily as we have to today. But we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So let's talk a little bit more about dynamic energy and look at some equations um, related to you know, so the energy of a pulse, a transition, and our power per transistor. So the energy you know, for a pulse of our transistor, so going from zero to one to zero, or one to zero to one, right? that amount of energy is going to be proportional to the capacitive load uh, times voltage squared. Right? So our capacitive load is going to be something dictated by our technology process, as well as something called our fan out. So how many other transistors are uh, this, this transistor connected to? Now we're typically more interested in say the energy of a single transition here. So transitioning from zero to one or one to zero, right? Because at the end of the day, that's what our clock is doing, right? These transitions of you know, zero to one or one to zero. So we can rewrite this equation by just inserting this one half. So the energy for a single transition is proportional to one half our capacitive load times our voltage squared. Now to get our power from, from this energy, all we really need to do is multiply this by our frequency. So we're multiplying the energy taken for a single transition times how fast we're doing these transitions. And that will give us um, our power over here. Now, an important thing to think about here is frequency, right? So clearly as we're you know, increasing our frequency, we're also going to be increasing our power. So a natural question to ask is what actually drove frequency scaling, right? Why were we able to increase, you know, our frequency by a thousand X, but not also increase our power uh, required by a thousand X. And the driving force behind this is something called Dennard scaling. So Dennard scaling comes from this you know, famous paper from I believe the 1970s, this design of ion implanted MOSFETs with very small physical dimensions. And this laid out some very nice scaling laws uh, related to transistors. So it basically said that as we scale our transistor dimensions, so if we say half the area of our transistors, we would also be decreasing our capacitance, we would decrease our voltage, and this would also decrease our delay. Now because delay is inversely related to frequency, right? so this would also increase the frequency of our processors while keeping our power constant. Right, so this, you know, these scaling laws basically said that we could double the amount of transistors in the same area while running them using the same amount of power. Right? And that's what really drove, um, you know, this increase in frequency and number of transistors on our chips for many decades. 
So where did it all go wrong, right? Why did eventually we stop being able to scale our frequency? So it turns out that once we got to a certain point and lowering our voltage and making our transistors small enough, that, that part of our energy consumption that we largely ignored, the static power, became incredibly significant. So our transistors at the end of the day are somewhat leaky. So they basically don't always turn completely off. Right? We think of our transistors as switches as either being on or off. But this is basically saying that we, we also have this leakage current. So our transistors are actually never fully off. So they're actually drawing power even when they're off. Now, as we scaled down our voltage, right, this really exacerbated the problem. And we really started to see difficulties once we got to the 90 nanometer and 65 nanometer uh, technology nodes. And unsurprisingly, when did those technology nodes happen? This was in the 2003 to 2006 kind of range, right, exactly when we started to see, you know, a halt in our frequency scaling. So, you know, basically, if we can't scale down our voltage, right, that frequency term, right, is going to keep increasing the amount of power required, right? So that's really where we started running into problems and our power really started to get out of hand. But it's important to think about while we're talking about power is that power isn't the only thing, right? So we've largely been concerned right now with the peak power of our processors. But we have to think about the kind of devices that we have today, right? So energy is really critical. So we have mobile devices that are everywhere, and most of these mobile devices, or pretty much all of these mobile devices, run on batteries, right? So that's an incredibly important thing to think about. It's also important to think about, you know, the fact that, you know, these things cost quite a lot to run, like massive server farms and warehouse scale computers. So the cost of power, of power and cooling at scale uh, can be incredibly expensive. Another thing that I, I think is important to think about is that we're not always designing for, say, uh, you know, peak power and peak performance. One of the most transformative things that, that has happened in you know, modern computing is not the fact that we keep making you know, larger and you know, more powerful processors, but it's simply the ubiquity of processors that we have today. So we have you know, very inexpensive and um, low power, you know, devices that are everywhere now that are shaping our lives. So it's not always just about, you know, designing for the most powerful, for the, you know, the most, you know, high, highest performance processors. All right, but that's going to go ahead and do it for today. As always, I'm Nick, and I hope you have a nice day.